Tonight our topic is called the blessings of salvation. And uh, Paul does two things. The first he does is he reminds them, because they're mainly Gentiles, non-Jewish people, of how far they were from God before they got saved and what God has done as a blessing for them after salvation. Now it's interesting we, we, we think in terms of churches growing and churches are changing. Uh, I was with a group of Presbyterian ministers and they're talking about uh, Presbyterian church planting in the 1950s. So they're going to plant a new Presbyterian church somewhere. Guess what they would normally do when they door knocked in the suburb? What's the first question they'd ask people? Are you Presbyterian? No, actually. It was pretty close though. Are you Scottish? <laughs> because the thought was if you're Scottish you'd go to a Presbyterian church. And so the, and there's a sense of, let's go and find all the Scottish people. Now, I was quite surprised. I couldn't work out uh, the stats for Presbyterianism worldwide. There's no website that gave me the information I was after. But I found one for Anglicans. Uh, do a bit of trivia time with you. What country in the world would have the most Anglicans? Africa. No, country. India? Now, India is about, I think, about 2.7 million, something like that. It was quite high. It might be second or third or fourth. I'd go for, say, Nigeria or something like that. Nigeria has over five and a half million Anglicans. Uh, if you go to England itself, it's about 2.3, 2.4 million. America is a, a similar number, about two, uh, two, uh, two plus million. And uh, 100 years ago, 95% of all Anglicans lived in England. So Nigeria was the most? Most, yeah, five and a half million. Now, the interesting thing is that uh, uh, 55% of all Anglicans are African. And uh, by far, one of the, the smallest amounts is actually now England itself. And England is dramatically depleting its number of church-attending Anglicans. Where um, I remember I, I put the stat up where uh, the stat I had was that 52% of Anglicans were African. And a friend just put up a, a sarcastic comment saying 97% of all quotes are stats are, are fake, all made up. And I then thought I'd do a bit of research. And my research found it was not 52%, but now 55%. And so there's been a massive increase. Uh, my next answer is not based on good research. But what uh, country probably has the most Presbyterians? Not China. <laughs> Korea. Korea. I'd say South Korea, Korea, South Korea probably has, and South Korea is probably, we're probably talking about ten or twenty million Presbyterians. So, and from my knowledge of uh, Korean, uh, if you say the word Christian or you say the word Presbyterian, the two words for most people mean the same thing. So if you say, "Oh, I go to a Presbyterian church," Koreans would hear you saying, "Oh, I go to a Christian church," because the two words are seen as uh, being basically synonymous with each other. Presbyterian first would be probably the biggest group in Korea. There are a lot in China. And China would be probably and Chinese Presbyterians would be absolutely mammoth in terms of their yeah. size as well. Yeah. In some of the islands, like in Vanuatu, that's predominantly yep. Pres- uh, but there's not, not a high population, but that's made, but nearly all Presbyterians there. I met a Presbyterian minister who worked in the Vanuatu island where um, it was quite funny because I asked him, you know, how many people would live in your eyes? He says, Oh, I don't know, maybe 2,207. And I said, well, what do you mean 2,207? He says, well, I'm not sure if anyone's not on the island at the moment. Yeah, and South I, Sudan. South Sudan is a strong Presbyterian. Presbyterian. And then I said to him, uh, well, how many people on your island would be Presbyterian? He says, oh, it would be very hard to tell. He says, of the 2,207, I think maybe 2,201. I think there's three Assemblies of God, two Seventh-day Adventists, and two people who don't go to church. It was, it was like as precise as that he knew... What everybody did, they had five churches on the island and every Sunday he would preach and then walk to the next part of the island. And so um, he'd probably walk 10, 15k every Sunday as he went from church to church because uh, they'd have churches of four or 500 people in each church and he'd just walk around the island. So it's a, a different world to what we see. So, Do you think when we get to the pearly gates, because they would say, oh, sorry, we can't get in but do you mean? You say you don't, I've got no underwear, so I just like having your kilts, so that's how I get you away with it. 
So it's interesting, um, for Paul, the, the issue wasn't uh, Scottish versus English or uh, whatever, but it was very much a Jewish versus Gentile battle. And for the early church, it was a real struggle because for a lot of the Christians who were Jewish, really thought that before you could get really saved, you had to go through Judaism to the road of grace. So there's a sense that saying you, know, you need to be circumcised, you need to understand that the battles we fought to be Jewish, and once you become Jewish, then you can get saved and get grace after you know the hard road that we have to go through. And it's interesting that uh, I think some churches can nearly do that. It's like this morning we, we talked about the person who um, uh, found it was a bit odd having a person who's not white in her church and, and saying to this multicultural person, uh, I'm not used to being in Bible study or church with a non-white person. You think, well, how, how, how could you ever say that to a person? Let alone think it. And so... Uh, they weren't even thinking it. They weren't even thinking it. So, so what was the battle Paul did? Because they don't have any problem. Yeah, good. Yeah, you shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad. <laughs> Amen. And if they started to say, I say, are you not speaking like English? <laughs> I just said, look, I don't know any other language but English. So that would horrify them. So what happens is, um, what's the battle they had between Jews and Gentiles? If you go back to the book of Acts chapter 15, it says, When Paul and Barnabas went to Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach believers, unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so this is the battle they had. Now, it was right. Uh, it was quite insidious because even the Apostle Peter struggled with it. So in Galatians chapter 2.11, when Peter came to Antioch, I had to oppose uh, Peter face to face, says Paul, for when he did it was wrong. When he first arrived, he ate with the Gentile believers who were not circumcised. But afterwards, when some friends of James came, Peter wouldn't eat with the Gentiles anymore. He was afraid of criticism from these people who insisted on the necessity of circumcision. As a result, other Jewish believers followed Peter's hypocrisy and even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. So it was part of Peter's journey. We find in Acts chapter 10 that Peter was hungry. But while a meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the sky open and something like a large sheet was let down with four corners. The sheet had all sorts of animals and reptiles and birds. Then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, go and eat. And Peter responded, No, Lord, I've never eaten anything that our Jewish law has declared impure or unclean. Uh... Uh, and it goes on to say that uh, a man will enter a Gentile house like this or associate with you, but Jew, uh, God has shown me that I uh, shall no longer think of anyone as impure or unclean. So there was this massive change in Peter's thinking of actually thinking, I can actually eat with Gentiles. And I imagine it would be very hard the first time Peter ever ate a prawn or a pork sandwich or had some bacon because it would be like you and I eating a cockroach or... Oh. Something, you know, that sense of to eat food that was unclean would have been offensive. And so we find in Galatians chapter 5 For if you're trying to make yourselves right with God by keeping the law, you have cut yourself off from Christ. You have fallen away from God's grace. Or it says in Colossians 2 When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not with a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. And so Paul could then go on uh, further in Colossians to warn them, don't let anyone condemn you by what you eat or drink or by not celebrating certain holy days or new moon festivals or Sabbaths. For these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. Christ himself is that reality. So what's Paul's warning to people who try to uh, sidetrack people? In Philippians 3, watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised, be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human nature. So what does it mean for you and I to be truly saved? 2 Timothy 1 For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was His plan from before the beginning of time that shows His grace through Christ Jesus. So what does it mean for you and I to have grace? Titus chapter 2. The grace of God has been revealed, bringing salvation to all people. So there's a sense that uh, Paul, when he writes to the Ephesians, saying, yes, you do have a past, but 
but more importantly, you have a future. Now, down at the surf club, that was rather humorous. I was having a great conversation with one of the girls I really chat to. She's a, a mum now with a number of boys, so we're talking about an older lady. And uh, she said with a great smile on her face, oh, I used to be a hooker. <laughs> Which uh, one of the guys uh, was quite cheeky about. And of course, what she was talking about was playing rugby league. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, there's a sense of... Uh, she, she was quite... Uh, she knew exactly what she was saying when she yes. described what we... We just said to her, I think you'd be a lot better if you played wing. <laughs> so you would have been a lot, uh, lot better off. But uh, there's a sense that... Um, each of us has a past. Each of us may have things about our past that are quite horrifying. Uh, we may have things about our past that if others knew, their jaws may drop. Uh, for some people, they might even say, I'm not sure if I'm comfortable to be your friend anymore because you've told me about yourself and uh, uh, that could be a little bit scary. We had a delightful situation with, uh, at Maroubra where a guy had been a hitman. Now, hitmen really I, I think actually kill people I think they normally just break arms and legs and so this guy I think was an arm and leg breaking hit man more than uh, a more serious one and next year Christopher Dale Frank Flannery right well in that case you, you might uh, actually kill people but uh, uh, I remember him saying not long after you were saved saying uh, look if there's anybody you ever want me to beat up or break a leg I'm happy to do it for you for free because I'm so appreciative of the difference that Jesus has made in my life to which I've kind of accepted him you really can't bake, break people's arms and legs anymore. I, in my head, I just assumed he would have known that's a, a bad job choice. And we had another girl who, uh, at Maruba who'd been a prostitute, and uh, she gets saved, and uh, she loved the King James Bible. And the Bible says, she said, look, uh, there's this word that keeps on hitting me that I, I don't know what it means, and I really think I should discover what it means. So what's that? So I have the word fornication. And so I explained that it was sex outside of marriage. Said, oh, you're actually allowed to have sex outside of marriage. I said, actually, no, not as a Christian. Oh, I better stop that, hadn't I? So I knew I was not allowed to be a prostitute, but I didn't know I, I should actually stop all sex with other people. He said, yes. He said, well, I, I'll, I'll stop that straight away. And it was a sense of uh, changed life. So what does it, how does Paul describe their changes? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. If we remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, but what is called the circumcision, which has been made in the flesh by hands. And uh, the New Living Version says, Don't forget that you Gentiles used to be outsiders. Another translation, remember that once you were not Jewish physically. And another translation, remember that once you formerly were Gentiles. There's a sense that each of them had a past and a story that would go with that. Paul goes on in verse 12 to say, In those days you were living apart from God. And then he describes what it means to be living apart from God. You're excluded from citizenship among God's people, the people of Israel. You did not know the covenant promises, not promise, one promise, but promises as all the promises that we have of the covenant relationships in the Old Testament, God had made to them. He then goes and say, you lived in this world without God, without hope. Now in the ESV it says that they were separated from God, alienated, strangers, having no hope and without God. So what does it mean to be separated from God? It means that we are not in relationship. There's a sense that uh, we would not even know how to pray. We, it, we may mumble words out, but have no idea what we're doing. But for those of us Jews who be Lord their life, that separation is gone. So Romans chapter 8 says, Can anything ever separate us now from the love of God? Does it mean He no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or persecuted or hungry or destitute? or in danger, or threatened with death? And the answer, of course, is no. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. We now have this uh, bond of link that He does not let us go as His children. Once we're described as being stateless. And I remember once there was a horrifying case where this man somehow escaped from a country that would not give him citizenship, was in an airport, and they asked him for his passports, and of course he said, I've got no passports. And uh, they said, well, you can't leave the airport without a passport. And for months, he actually lived in the airport uh, waiting room as he uh, tried to negotiate to find a country who would take him. And so he would just sit there and beg and people would give him food because he ran out of money. But he was a person without a country, without a state, and was, was stuck 
in this airport lounge. Now each of them would have come from different cultures and different countries, but God's saying, you will now be my people and I'll be in my relationship with you. The third thing they describe is being people who are friendless. And for you and I, the day we became believers, God becomes our friend. I remember uh, having an interesting situation where a friend of mine led an Israeli guy to Christ who had been involved in their uh, nuclear program, the uh, nuclear weapons program. And uh, he you know, released this information to the world. And the Israeli government was to, uh, to kidnap him. I think he was in uh, Italy at the time. They got him secretly back to Israel where he spent years upon years in uh, solitary confinement. He's actually possibly the longest person to ever be in solitary confinement ever, and he did not go mad. And uh, he was eventually released, and uh, people would say, well, you know, you were there by yourself month after month with nobody to speak to. How did you not go insane? So said, because I was not alone, because God was my friend. There's a friendship factor. The fourth thing, of course, we're reminded in terms of our salvation is that we now are no longer living without, uh, without hope. We're no longer hopeless people. So in Romans chapter 5, we can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials and we know that they help us to develop endurance. And endurance develops character. Character uh, strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment for we know how dearly God loves us because he's given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. And one of the joys of uh, sharing at the, uh, the, the Last Supper yesterday with Robin was her incredible hope and confidence she has in her salvation and knowing that uh, there's a door that will open and the door is to eternity. And part of it is the sense of saying, yeah, why am I waiting? I'm ready to go through the door now. Why is God holding up, letting the door be open to us? As we get to the next verse, chapter 2, verse 13 of Ephesians, it gives us the, the, the big promise that we're united with Christ. But now you've been united with Christ. Once you were far off and away from God, but now you have been brought near. So the second thing is, after being the unity of Christ, is that we're brought near to Christ. It, says, uh, it goes on in that verse to say, but now you've been brought near to Him through the blood of Christ. The third promise is that we're no longer at war with God, that we're now his friends, we now have peace with him. So in verse 14, for God, or for Christ himself, has brought peace to us. Then in verse 15, he made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from two groups. And there's a sense for our church especially that uh, uh, we will have people who will be brand new Christians. We have people who come from totally different cultures and backgrounds to us. And God will bring everything together and make a, uh, a patchwork quilt of uh, people. And there's a sense that as people come into our church from different backgrounds, uh, what does it do to our church? It enriches our church. It uh, enlivens our church. It excites our church. As God says, look at the diversity and look at the variety of what I can do and the lives that I can change. He goes on in verse 17 to say, He brought this good news of peace to you, Gentiles who are far away from him, and peace to the Jews who are near. And so this is a true sense that uh, we're not at war with God. And yes, we may sin, but it doesn't empty the promises that God has given to us. The next big area that Paul wants to really encourage, especially because of the diversity of the people in the church, is the amazing unity they have with other believers. He goes on in verse 15 to say, He united Jews and Gentiles into one people. When in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. And in verse, the next verse, He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. He made peace between Jews and Gentiles by creating in himself one new people from the two groups. And so uh, we will all have stories. There'll be some who might say, I've always been brought up in a church. Others will say, I've never been to church until I became an adult. And for me, uh, I had spasmodic church visits. It wasn't until I actually got converted at 18 at university that, I, that the, the transformation happened. 
And I remember quite funny that I, as a new Christian, uh, having a talk at uh, university, and the person said, he, oh, who here has read the whole Bible? And I hadn't read the whole Bible at that stage. And he made me, me and the others feel quite guilty because we hadn't read the whole Bible, especially for those who've been Christians all their life. That's one of the first things I did was say, I better read the whole Bible from cover to cover because I'll be embarrassed if I don't. And uh, I've been amazed at um, uh, how often you'll get new Christians who've got no church background will suddenly devour the Scriptures. We had an interesting situation when we were at Mount Drew. We had a lovely, lovely man who... Um, his friend said to him, because his wife had died of a heroin overdose, his uh, brother-in-law had died of a heroin overdose, so he had a pretty wild family. And his mate said to him, you're such a mongrel of a man, your kids have no hope, you better take your kids to Sunday school because they get no ethics or morality from you. And uh, he thought that was a pretty serious thing to do, so he arrived at our church's youth group with his kids in tow. We'd never get there on time, we'd never get there at 7 o'clock at night to, uh, to start. Be the, uh, anything up to an hour late and he says there's no point in me going home because as soon as I get home it'll be time to pick up the kids again and so he'd come and sit in on the Bible talks for these kids and some of the leaders said yeah, what are you going to do with him he said look it's okay he'll, come, he'll be in my group each week he'll be okay because they're a bit scared a bit daunted by him and so he'd sit there and listen to these kids talks week after week he eventually got saved and very profoundly saved and uh, he is now a deacon in a Baptist church. And I sometimes meet people from his church and say, has this man ever shared his testimony with you? He said, why? He says, I think you'd be horrified to, knew, to know where he had come from to where God has brought him to today. And their response was they just thought he'd always been a Christian because he's such a godly, godly guy. And after he got saved, he was not a reader. But he says, I can't believe it. I sit down every night and just spend hours and hours reading the Bible. He says, and when I got to the end of the Bible, I thought, what do I do now? I said, I know what I do. I go back to the beginning and start all over again. And that's what he does. Just reads Genesis to Revelation, Genesis to Revelation, Genesis to Revelation over and over again. Why? Because God is in the business of changing people. And that's our fifth promise here, without being reconciled. Together as one body, Christ reconciled both groups to God by means of his death on the cross. And how hostility towards each other was put to death. Those who were once enemies have now become friends. And Paul finishes with this whole section just to remind them what was it cost for their salvation. So in chapter 2, verse 18, Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. What do you and I share in common? That Christ has died for us. What do we share in common? The Holy Spirit that fills each of us is in unity with each of us. What do we share in common? That we have the same destination of eternity together. What do we share in common? That God wants to work in us as individuals and wants to work in us as a church. Now it's interesting, uh, I don't like ever using you know, the word, this is what the Greek says, because it, it kind of creates an elitism. But uh, nearly every single time the word you was used in this passage, it wasn't you, the individual, but you, the corporate identity. So it's us who's received the Spirit, us who've received forgiveness, us who've received transformation. And that is what gives us our bond of who we are as people. Let's just bow our heads in prayer. Father, forgive us if we don't open our eyes to see how wide it is for the kingdom of God. Father, you will bring a diverse range of people into our church. Whoever comes through our door, may we welcome them and love the fact that you've called them into our, our ministry here. Father, thank you that our past is forgiven and our future is assured. Father, may we hunger to do your will we find maybe hunger to serve you daily. Amen.